sense, but it doesn't. Okay, practical issues. So, we're going to be much better at timekeeping today than we were yesterday. Today it's Norwegian time. <laughs> and when we're in the breaks, the lunch breaks or the coffee breaks, <laughs> when you hear that sound, it's time to go to the next session. Um, yeah, today is the World Mental Health Day. And you are very welcome to tweet about that. And we're going to be uh, celebrating that or marking it um, both with the Medical Humanities Tour, which has a mental health topic. And you can join that in the coffee break at 11.30. And the film at lunchtime is also about mental health. And that's, got a, uh, that's from Brazil. And again, we'll ring a bell when the film starts. But I'd recommend both the film and the tour. Tonight's dinner. If you have registered for tonight's dinner, please pick up your voucher today, okay? Before the dinner. If you're unsure if you've registered, they have a list. If you have not registered and you still want to go, you can go to the restaurant and pay at the restaurant. And that will cost you 143 um, Rio. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so don't forget to pick up your voucher at the registration desk. Um, the people who've been uh, lending out the um, things have a nice collection of personal passports, IDs, driver's license, etc. If you want them back, it's a good idea to give your... is any easier. Do you want to be in the group photo? If you do, we're doing it immediately after this plenary in the garden. And we're going to be quick. So um, be there or be square. So uh, let's get on to the plenary. It'll be the same as yesterday. Um, you will have translation. Um, uh, will be, it'll be in, in English and Portuguese, I think. And um, same procedure as yesterday. And again, people listening in uh, via the virtual platform can submit questions using the chat function. OK. So this session is about humanizing policies and programs and the role of qualitative health. And John Lavis is going to be chair, so I'll hand over to him. Thanks. It starts to kick in. Great. Can we load up the next slide deck? So they're numbered from one to five, the ones that we handed in. This is slide deck one. A couple of slides from me, John Lavis. So we'll just wait for those to kick in. Oh, maybe that we need to go through Claire's. These are all the people on the panel, but I have another one. So we'll now load the next slide deck. Great, fantastic. So thanks everybody for joining us. Um, 
Today, we're, this session is supposed to be about qualitative evidence, but often I find we end up moving into what I would consider citizen engagement. But I think it's still highly relevant because I think we often use qualitative research techniques when we're using robust citizen engagement mechanisms. So that's why I've made that modification on the slide. Uh, Claire has covered most of the housekeeping, so welcome back to day two. We're delighted to see you. Um, as Claire mentioned, this is a, a Norwegian-Brazilian co-production, so the working sessions are on Norwegian time, which means we start and end as close to time as possible. Uh, the parties are on Brazilian time, so I look forward to um, a very late evening with all of you. So our focus now is on how policies and programs can be made more acceptable, feasible, equitable, and sustainable through the wider use of qualitative evidence and what I hope are systematic uh, citizen engagement processes. So we're going to have a couple of presenters in English, and Fernanda's going to present in Portuguese. So just be ready with your translation headsets if, you're, uh, if you need help with either of those languages. In the chat room, you can also pose questions in Spanish. Just remember, we're broadcasting live, so we need to make sure that when you're asking questions, you're speaking into the microphone. Uh, please turn your mobile phones to silent, and please be ready with your questions. We really want to hear your thoughts about how we build on the strengths that are already present in this field and how we take it a step further. So an overview of the plenary, I just have a few slides to put the three speakers presentations in perspective so you see how they fit together. Then we'll hear from each of the three speakers and we have Megan who is sitting in the front who is going to give a three minute warning and a one minute warning. So you'll see her trying to get the attention of the speakers just to make sure that we, we stay on time. The great thing about our speakers is we have Fernanda bringing a research perspective, Velia bringing a policymaker perspective, Walter bringing a civil society perspective. So we have a lovely triangle, three different takes on this issue. Then the conference organizers have asked us to focus on, initially it was five themes, but we've zeroed in on four given the time. Uh, how can policymakers and citizens identify the need for qualitative evidence? How can they quickly locate it? How can that evidence help them design or develop policies and programs that are more acceptable, feasible, equitable, and sustainable? And then the parallel question to that is how can citizen engagement do the same things? So I'd strongly encourage you to be thinking about how can you contribute to that conversation? How can we get the need right? How can we locate the evidence? How can we get the qualitative evidence into the design and development process? And how can we use citizen engagement as well? So then we'll have 20 minutes for questions, and uh, we'll see how we do with time, whether we have zero minutes or 10 minutes for the wrap-up. So I have a couple of quick slides to put the speaker's contributions in perspective. So one way to think about the complementary takes on today's presentations is to ask what type of qualitative evidence are they talking about? Fernanda is going to come at it from the perspective of a more focused research evidence take. So she's going to talk about the use of something called nominal group technique. Walter is going to tell us a fascinating story of his work in Guatemala with citizen monitors, where they are systematically collecting data about the reach of programs and the experiences of citizens with those programs. And then we're going to hear from Velia with the many inputs that she draws on in supporting the Parliament of Malawi uh, as they grapple with questions and work through policy processes. So three different takes on uh, the evidence. The next thing is some variation in how they engage citizens. So the leftmost column is kind of a, 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 a taxonomy of increasingly empowering ways to engage citizens in policy processes. So we can share information, we can consult with them, we can engage them in deliberations, and we can collaborate, actually hand over some of the power for decision making to citizens. We don't have the full spectrum of perspectives on that on the panel, but we have Velia talking about how parliamentarians consult with citizens. 
Both Fernanda and Walter are going to be talking about more systematic processes of consulting with citizens, and Walter is going to talk about how citizens engage in deliberations with policymakers. So we have some interesting takes on citizen engagement. The third way that the speakers vary is in the stage of the policymaking process that they engage in. So none of the speakers are focused specifically on, on how qualitative evidence or citizen engagement can help to frame problems and their causes, or when we're talking about the Sustainable Development Goals, how they can frame goals and targets. But Velia is going to be talking about um, how evidence and citizen input can play into policy development, especially the acceptability of policies and programs, less the how and why questions that Ruth and others spoke about yesterday. None of the speakers talk directly about engaging citizens in understanding barriers and facilitators to implementation, but two of them uh, tell very interesting stories about the role of qualitative evidence and citizen engagement in monitoring and evaluation. So Walter is going to talk about, as I mentioned before, monitoring reach and experiences. And the lovely, one of the many lovely things about Walter's contribution is if the citizens don't get their, uh, a satisfactory response at the municipal level, they go up to the provincial level. If they're still not happy, they go up to the national level. So they have a, a very proactive approach to escalating problems. And Fernanda is going to talk about the use of qualitative research to evaluate how and why impacts are achieved. The final way that the speakers complement one another is with the part of government that they intersect with. So we often think of there being three parts of government, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. And the executive often has a political side and a more administrative side. So Fernanda, her work often brings her in contact with the administrative side of government, working with the ministry, for example. Velia specifically works for the legislature, so she works for the parliament of Malawi. And Walter, with his band of citizen monitors, is actually working on all three parts of, uh, well, two parts of government, both parts of the executive and with the legislature. So as you'll see, we have three very, very helpfully complementary presentations today. Final comment before I turn it over to Fernanda. Remember, qualitative evidence, like any type of evidence, has to compete for people's hearts and minds. And we heard yesterday how stories can help in that competition. We need evidence to help get issues on agendas. And remember that politicians need a compelling problem a viable policy and conducive politics. And qualitative evidence and citizen engagement can help to understand that problem and that policy. Once something's on the agenda, we have to make then very specific choices. This is sometimes called the policy development phase. And research evidence, qualitative evidence in particular, is a source of ideas, but those ideas aren't just evidence, there's also ideas like citizens' values that need to drive decision making. And politicians are dealing with many interest groups, they're working under institutional constraints, they're affected by other events happening outside the country and sometimes within wars, economy, downturns, other things. So remember that we don't just need to make a case for qualitative evidence being among the types of evidence being considered. We need to make sure that it's being considered alongside all of these other forces. So with that long-winded introduction, I'm going to turn it over to the first of three speakers, Fernanda Sobral. She's a professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Brasilia here in Brasilia, bringing a researcher perspective. We're delighted to have you, Fernanda. Welcome. Over to you. So your slides will come up in a minute. And do you want to go up here? Yes. Bom dia a todas e todos. Eu vou falar em português, que é a minha língua mãe. Bem, é, nessa minha apresentação, 
eu vou falar da contribuição dos estudos sociais da ciência e tecnologia, que no Brasil é, tem essa sigla, ESCT, Estudos Sociais em Ciência e Tecnologia, é, para a elaboração e avaliação de políticas públicas a partir de metodologias que buscam a evidência qualitativa. Primeiro, eu vou mostrar... É, certos princípios metodológicos e abordagens utilizadas de, por esses estudos, e depois eu vou tratar especificamente de um trabalho que realizou, o segundo, uma avaliação de impactos de uma política pública ou de um programa na área de educação, ciência e tecnologia, e que também usou a evidência qualitativa. Primeiro, eu queria mostrar... É a abordagem metodológica desses estudos sociais em ciência e tecnologia. Um dos princípios é o princípio da simetria entre componentes sociais e científicos. O que é que significa isso? Significa que o contexto sociopolítico influencia a prática científica de algum modo. A ciência resolve problemas justamente por ajustar interesses cognitivos e sociais. Ou seja, o social configura certos elementos do conteúdo da ciência e tecnologia. Outro aspecto que eu queria destacar dessa abordagem é a perspectiva microsocial, centrada, sobretudo, nos estudos de laboratório e das análises das controvérsias sobre a interpretação da realidade e produção de consensos. Bem... A construção do argumento verdadeiro na prática científica, ela é, na realidade, fruto de negociações, acordos, interpretações. Os estudos sociais de ciência e tecnologia englobam, de uma maneira geral, os seguintes temas. As condições, né, a investigação das condições sociais, culturais, regionais e institucionais da produção do conhecimento, as formas de decisão e escolha sobre os grandes sistemas técnicos inseridos na nossa vida cotidiana, a relação entre especialistas e leigos no contexto da produção do conhecimento, os mecanismos de engajamento público entre os impactos, dos impactos socioambientais decorrentes da utilização dos sistemas tecnológicos. Mas eu gostaria de destacar, sobretudo para esse evento, um, uma área temática desses estudos, que é a que busca dar conta da interface entre público e ciência. É o terceiro aqui e o quarto também. Bem, é, cujo objetivo é analisar a relação entre conhecimento leigo e conhecimento perito, preocupando-se também com as formas como que se constitui o entendimento público em relação à ciência e tecnologia. Esse, esse tipo de abordagem questiona o lugar dos especialistas. Claro que os especialistas têm um papel fundamental na produção do conhecimento, mas o público interessado não pode também ser um mero espectador. Essa é a ideia. Nesse enfoque, o público começa a ser considerado ou seja, percebe-se relações mais simétricas entre o público e o conhecimento. Bem, eu vou dar um exemplo muito rápido da agroecologia. A agroecologia é um novo campo de estudo que se baseia numa epistemologia participativa e política que respeita a diversidade ecológica e sociocultural, defende um tipo de conhecimento que é, ao mesmo tempo, holístico, plural, mas que privilegia o contexto local. Essa disciplina científica passou a ser designada como um movimento formado por organizações não governamentais, sociedade civil e segmento acadêmico. E tem uma influência muito forte nas políticas públicas. Bem, nesse sentido, o que eu estou querendo dizer é que se a produção do conhecimento, é, segundo essa vertente, deve envolver o público interessado, as políticas públicas devem fazer o mesmo e também envolver o conhecimento científico e o conhecimento leigo. Bem, passando para o segundo momento da minha fala, eu vou dar um exemplo aqui, como eu 
de um estudo avaliativo de impactos de um programa nessa área de educação, ciência e tecnologia, que também pode se enquadrar como estudos sociais em ciência e tecnologia. Nesse estudo, as condições ou o contexto do programa foi considerado na avaliação, e não apenas o programa propriamente dito, por meio de uma metodologia qualitativa. Esse caso foi um trabalho que eu fiz com Gilberto Lacerda Santos sobre a Olimpíada Brasileira de Matemática. Como tem muitos que não são do Brasil, eu vou ter que explicar um pouquinho. Essa Olimpíada foi criada em 2004, tem como é, objetivos contribuir para a melhoria da educação básica, identificar jovens talentos e incentivar seu ingresso nas carreiras científicas e tecnológicas, incentivar também o aperfeiçoamento dos professores das escolas públicas, integrar as escolas públicas com as universidades e promover a inclusão social por meio da difusão do conhecimento. A UBMEP premia os alunos com medalhas de diferentes tipos e também com bolsas de estudo. Os professores das escolas, eles são premiados, das as escolas que têm medalhistas, com cursos de atualização e aperfeiçoamento no IMPA, que é o Instituto de Pesquisa aplicado, é, Pura e Aplicada em Matemática, muito reconhecido aqui no Brasil. O objetivo, qual foi o objetivo do nosso trabalho? Identificar o impacto efetivo dessa ação pública no ensino de matemático nas escolas públicas por ela alcançada. Na medida em que havia um sucesso quantitativo, quer dizer, o um grande número de inscritos, é, apontava, é, nós queríamos revelar as condições de sucesso qualitativo da iniciativa, a fim de contribuir para uma melhor compreensão dos limites e das possibilidades dessa importante política pública. Nesse sentido, nós utilizamos a técnica do grupo nominal para é, trabalhar com gestores, professores e alunos de escolhas medalhistas, que tinham um grande número de medalhas. Essa técnica consiste em uma técnica de tomada de decisões em grupo, cuja característica fundamental é o fato de os participantes, apesar de estarem frente a frente, eles apresentam suas ideias de forma sistemática e totalmente independente. Então, é, grupos, a gente faz grupos de 10 participantes, aí a, a identificação e a apresentação do problema sob a forma de uma questão Cada elemento do grupo, sem qualquer discussão anterior, escreve de forma independente a resposta que ele daria àquela questão. E depois há uma apresentação das ideias formuladas pelos participantes e uma discussão coletiva. E depois tem uma classificação das proposições, da mais importante à menos importante. O, os temas abordados, eu nem vou tratar aqui, porque... É, talvez não interesse tanto mais a técnica, os temas abordados foram esses, que tinham a ver com a própria OBMEP, e tipo assim, as repercussões pessoais e profissionais decorrentes da participação e da eventual premiação na OBMEP. Finalmente, eu visando responder às perguntas que já foram colocadas aqui, eu tentei contribuir aqui mostrando como a evidência qualitativa e o engajamento público são importantes para a produção do conhecimento, associando especialistas a não especialistas nos diferentes campos científicos e também na área de ciências da saúde, além da sua participação na avaliação de políticas públicas enquanto beneficiários. A democracia amplia a necessidade de prestação de contas à sociedade e também a participação de diferentes atores sociais nos processos decisórios. Obrigada. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I will 
will be speaking on the role of qualitative evidence in helping parliaments to achieve the SDGs. One would ask, do parliaments really rely on qualitative evidence to inform decision making? A lot of people, when they hear of parliaments and the politicians, all they think is that decisions in the parliament are made only out of politics. But today I'm here to inform decision makers here, evidence genera generators that are here, and evidence blockers to say, parliament is one of an institution that is information demanding all the time. And the parliamentarians are interested in evidence of all types you may think of. This evidence could be practical, empirical, theoretical. They need all the types of evidence for them to achieve the SDGs. And this evidence could come from academic research. Thank you, Fernanda, for sharing what you've shared. That's what members of parliament are looking for. And this evidence could also come from individuals, organizations, government, and most importantly, from the citizens whom they represent. And all types of sources of knowledge is of potential value and is welcome to parliament. And this is where qualitative evidence is crucial since it provides in-depth insight on the legislation, representation, representation and oversight roles. Now, what role does qualitative research play in order to inform decision making in parliament? Qualitative research does a number of things. For example, qualitative research is there to help the parliamentarians to support effective scrutiny of government policies and government implementation of activities. For example, if members of parliament are to scrutinize government policies, they need evidence. And also, qualitative evidence provide a number of background information for members of parliament to act on. For example, if there is a policy on going back to schools for girls who dropped out of school, members of parliament would, would need information. I don't know the context of Brazil, but the context of many African parliament, there is no really qualification for one to become a member of parliament. They, be, they are from different academic backgrounds. Like, for example, in Malawi, a qualification for a member of parliament, for one to become a member of parliament, is that that particular person should be able to speak English. That's the qualification. So whether you have a degree, you've been to school, you haven't been to school, it doesn't matter. Now, we have such people who are members of parliament. We need them to represent their people. We need them to scrutinize the government. Now, if you don't give them information, you can imagine the type of decisions they will make. And again, with such a diverse academic background, there is a need for evidence blockers, evidence generators, to work hand in hand with such a diverse background of, background of members of parliament in order for them to make evidence-informed decisions. And Evidence is also there to substantiate pre-existing pre views on hypotheses, but also provide credibility and enhance public image. Now, when members of parliament are in parliament and they are debating, they always score political points when whatever they are speaking, if they are basing it on evidence. For example, if their debate is like, but the evidence that we have on is this policy is talking about A, but that evidence should also back with what their people are saying. The voices of their people always carry the day. So as we are taking evidence to members of parliament, we should be mindful of what the people are saying. And this is where qualitative information is more important. Because 
When a member of parliament is told his stories of what is behind the policies, they are more likely to use our evidence to make their argument. Now, how do we engage policy makers and evidence blockers into the co-production co of qualitative research in order to inform a decision? Knowledge blockers and policy makers are influential because we are the people who are believing in the cause of what we are advocating for. Now, because we are, so, we are so passionate about what we want to advo advocate for. We are so important in making sure that this e evidence is synthesized to the level that a decision maker will relate with and use that to make a decision. And knowledge blockers and policy makers are able to provide emotive response and campaign passionately about the issues. We know, as knowledge blockers, we know how to influence what is going on in the parliament. Actually, when you look at the parliament, parliament is an institution where all types of evidence is going to be used. If your evidence is palatable to government members of MPs, you are assured that they are going to use the evidence. Why are the opposition who reject that evidence? And if your evidence is rejected by members of opposition, government will use it. If government is rejecting your evidence, members of opposition will use your evidence. So my plea is, parliament is an institution where all types of information you have will be used. It will be used either by the government members of, of parliament or the opposition members of parliament. So it is an exciting institution if we are to take our evidence to that. Unfortunately, we knowledge producers, we don't take evidence to parliament. How many of us in this room have specific measures to make sure that whatever evidence we have is triggering down to parliament? How many of us do that? specific measures to say, yes, these are my findings. I'm we are sharing the findings here, but the findings or the research we are sharing here, how many of us who've shared that with our parliaments where we're coming from? you find that a few people do that. Yet members of parliament are looking for that information. It, it doesn't matter which party they belong to. One way or another, they are going to use that evidence. Now, what are the activities that are there to enhance qualitative evidence uptake among parliamentarians? There is provision of background information on, N on NSDG, SDGs before the committee, including bills and policies. Now, we are in an era of SDGs. Very soon, we are going to be e evaluating the strides we've made or the implementation of SDGs. And the parliament, they've got parliamentary committees on each of the 17 SDGs. And qualitative research plays a very good role in terms of providing an explanation to the targets that we are achieving. Why are we achieving those targets? Why are we not achieving? Are we on the right track on achieving the targets? Now, also, we need to identify key issues to look at for, for presentation or testimonies of stakeholders appearing before committees. When the parliament is meeting, qualitative research also provides background context on the key issues which parliament is deliberating on. But also, it provides on spot guidance to follow up issues and support country delegation with background papers on various topics at international meetings where countries are expected to follow progress on what they are making as far as SDGs are concerned. Now, do we have structures in the parliaments that are there supporting uptake of qualitative evidence? When we say parliamentarians do not use evidence, but do we have structures that are there supporting the uptake of evidence? 
The answer is yes. Most of the parliaments, including Parliament of Malawi, we've got structures like research department, libraries, that are there to support members of parliament to provide evidence to that are there supporting secretariat to, sub, to, to provide evidence to parliamentarians. This is a structure which we can take advantage of in order for us to be sharing our evidence with parliaments. The parliaments have got a full-fledged research department, and they also have libraries. It is a matter of us connecting with th those structures whenever we want to take our evidence to parliament. And then... In the parliament, we've got a system of providing policy briefs that are there to explain an issue. Members of parliament, sometimes they cannot read our 20-page reports or even five-page reports. But when we provide them with the one-page policy brief, it is going to share more information to them for them to use it in order to make a decision. But also, there is a strong linkages between think tanks and the civil society organization. Yes, we are to hear a presentation from here, from, from water here. Parliaments, they've got a good mechanism that links them and the civil society organizations. In fact, members of parliament would listen more to information coming from civil society than any other institution because civil society speak on behalf of the people they represent. And, and also, we, we've got strong linkages with the, the academia. Academia are think tanks. They are knowledge generators for members of parliament to use. This is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you for your attention. They always surprise me. Just when I'm trying to say, oh, we have to get going, boom, the presentation's over. So thank you both very much. So, Walter, over to you. So we've heard from a a researcher perspective, a policymaker perspective, and now we're going to hear from a civil society organization perspective. Walter, welcome. Okay, great. Okay, so what I'm going to talk specifically is the experience of uh, rural indigenous communities in Guatemala. And before I need to start a, a explaining that evidence generated by citizens or users is not a continuation or is the same information evidence generated by authorities. The need for citizens to generate evidence is because of gaps in service delivery, because of barriers, because inequities. So the evidence that is generated by users, by communities, is based on their experience, uh, life, while reaching the services or trying to use the services. So is, is, the, is the experience of their own families or the neighbors about the barriers that they are facing, but also something that is facilitated, and more importantly, what sort of abuses are happening, and any of this information or evidence uh, are not collected uh, regularly by, by, the, by the authorities. So the whole purpose of civis, or citizen producing evidence, again, is not to replicate uh, what the authorities already produce, but try to get information about what is missing there, especially for rural and marginalized populations, they are very easy left out in, in, in the system. So this, this specific uh, uh, experience of Guatemala is based on on community defended for the right to health, and in, in that purpose, uh, even if the communities are collecting their own evidence, we need to be uh, clear that there are also methods and approaches to that. And evidence generated by users, by communities, have to have four main criteria. The first one is that the information that they collect that eventually become evidence has to be standardized information. It's not any information has to be standardized, communities agree on what are the standards. Secondly, it has to be systematic. It's not one-off information. It is quarterly information, monthly, etc. The third one is has to be verifiable information. It has to be verifiable information. Information that any authority can verify that this is actually happening. And the fourth is that it has to be relevant. Relevant 
for those people using the services. For instance, in many countries there are, there are approaches to involve user of services into collecting some information, but the information may not be relevant. For instance, I know many experience that they involve users to collect information about whether the schools or facilities were recently painted or not, for instance. This, this is not as relevant as information of citizens collecting about stockouts of medicine or stockouts at schools, for instance, which are very important for rural schools or rural facilities. So based on this, the information and the evidence that citizens generate, because they need to understand the information and engage with that, is, is, is photographies, short videos with testimonies of people about problems they are facing, but also uh, oral testimonies, life stories about what's happening with the, with the family, individual complaints, and, and report cards. And I'm going to show you quickly some images of this work. Uh, also, in order to be able to generate the evidence, communities, use of the service has to be informed about the rights, the entitlements, and also what is the mechanism to do that. So one important work of the citizen monitor is to inform their own communities. For that, they use a, a community radio, but also they, a, they use information outside healthcare facilities. So people know that there are certain standards and they know how to inform about those standards. Uh, this is images of the monitoring of stockouts that I was mentioning. Also, they do a lot of exit interviews, but these exit interviews are not the regular quality of services interview that we do sometimes as researchers, but they are exit interviews about issues that are of relevance to users, especially in rural indigenous communities, such as, did you experience discrimination? Were you asked for illegal payment? Because this is a very common problem in rural communities, illegal payment. So this is the exit interview again, makes emphasis on the experience of users. Uh, in these two images, we have the collection of evidence. As I mentioned, it was photography, short videos. Also, this is exhibited. The whole idea is that to, to show the rest of the communities what's happening in terms of the gaps that have been identified. And in all this evidence, is also presented to, to authorities. The first step is to present it to the local authority, the municipal. Sometimes they cannot resolve the problems either because they don't have the, the authority at that level of the resources. Then they move to the provincial level. It's still not resolved. They go all the way to the national level. This is in December 2016 that they follow for six months at each level of governance until they reach to the minister and the vice ministers. It's also very important that uh, citizen monitors, they learn how the state apparatus work, also what is the purpose of the, of the parliament, because even if the Ministry of Health is not resolving or they don't have sufficient funding, they know that the parliament is where funds are allocated. So they go and meet with parliamentarians. Also, they learn to understand that there are checks and balances in the state apparatus that even in parliament or even for the Ministry of Health, there are specific checks and balances such as the Human Rights Commissioner, which in the Guatemala, in the Guatemala legal framework is the public authority in charge of monitoring public services in general. And finally, some, some recent publications about all this experience that we have done in, in the past two years. This is open, open access information. And I, I want to finalize saying that in terms of the SDGs, it's very clear that what citizens engaging in evidence, is, is, if we talk of health, is important for SDG 3. But if you could see in the images, there is a lot of women in the images as well. Women that they started as a, taking their child to the facility, but in that process, they learn about how the system works, they learn about entitlements, and they learn how to engage with authorities. So there has been a whole process of empowerment. So we are, we are also contributing to SDG 5, which is gender equity. And if you could see in this process that the basis is to demand accountability. So we are also engaging with SDG 16, which is 
about accountable institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. So we're just going to move to the last slide deck where some of the themes are described. So remember I said at the beginning that the organizers asked us to tackle four themes, and I told you what they were in advance. I've asked the panelists which ones they would feel comfortable speaking to. So if we can just pull up slide deck five, you'll see what they are. Um, so I'm just going to jump to the first two. So the first one is this the... Walter, did you say you were okay answering the first one? Yes, I think yeah. so. Yeah, so let me just go back to it. Whoops. There we go. So the first question, which we'll spend a couple of minutes on, how can policymakers and citizens identify the need for qualitative evidence in their SDG agenda setting, policy development, policy implementation, and M&E work? So what I, the, the ones in red are my reactions. My reaction is we should just mainstream this stuff. Like folks in working in government have typically structured frameworks that they're working from to, to force them to be systematic as they think through issues. And so we've just mainstreamed qualitative evidence. You can't understand a problem without looking for qualitative evidence. You can't fully think through options without looking for qualitative evidence. You can't fully think through implementation without looking for qualitative evidence. So one answer from my perspective is structured frameworks, but Walter also has some other thoughts on this one. <coughs> yes, uh, based on our experience, it's also important the, the politics about the, the messenger. For instance, for us as researchers, maybe part of our work would be to identify the gaps in terms of policy implementation and so forth, but many decision makers do not, do not like to receive this information from researchers or from academics because they always think there is some motive behind. So in our experience, the legitimacy of a user of services, collecting the evidence and then bringing this, the evidence is, is very powerful. In 10 years, we rarely have any, any politician, decision American saying, I do not believe this information. They could be only photographies, they can be short testimonies, but the user of service has some legitimacy that can actually convince parliamentarians, the minister, about the importance of hearing the voice of citizens that are actually the users of the service. Microphones on at the same time, fantastic. So uh, if you have reactions to that question, please introduce them during the Q&A section. So let's move on to theme two, question two. So here the question was, how can policymakers and citizens quickly locate relevant qualitative evidence? So this was one that none of the panelists specifically wanted to weigh in on this. So we invite comments from all of you during the Q&A. I've just given a couple of example, examples. Um, of a citizen targeted evidence portal. So there's one that we were involved in, the McMaster Optimal Aging Portal. It pulls the best science from social systems evidence. So there's now, outside of health, more than 3,000 systematic reviews, all sitting in one place, covering all of the non health SDGs. So we can take out of that the actionable evidence for citizens and then translate it into plain language and make it available for citizens. Another example, not citizen targeted, but Ludovic, I saw here somewhere, Ludovic Reves, where are you sitting? Right here. So if you want to know more about his database, he now has the only database we're aware of in the world with guidelines that are based on the grade model. And what we're hoping is soon he will specifically flag the guidelines that use grade CERQUAL, which is a method developed by Simon, Ruth, many other people in this room. Um, to grade the quality of the qual qualitative evidence so, uh, and to make sure that the recommendations are informed by that. So that's going to be an incredibly helpful resource to be able to identify uh, qualitative evidence that has gone through the grade CERQUAL approach. Can you comment? Yes, fantastic. Well, I think it was the exposition of Walter that gave me the answer. How eu, eu achei muito interessante aquela ideia de filmar certos acontecimentos na área de saúde, uma figura que eu vi aí, quer dizer, como se pode localizar evidência qualitativa para que justamente se chegue para o ministro ou para o secretário de saúde. Então, 
é, eu acho, é, eu diria que o trabalho do Walter foi que me apontou uma forma pela qual os, aqueles que fazem as políticas e cidadões, cidadãos podem localizar é, uma evidência qualitativa. Fernanda. So the third question, uh, which Velia and Fernanda uh, are going to respond to, is how can qualitative evidence help design or develop policies and programs that are more acceptable, feasible, equitable, and sustainable? So you see my uh, provisional answer. I think we need to be systematically using relevant types of qualitative evidence when windows of opportunity open in political processes. And we see this done in many countries. It's doable. We just need to do it systematically. But Velia, can I turn it over to you for your thoughts about uh, how to do this better? Or uh, from the parliamentary experience and practice, qualitative evidence is there to provide the voices of what is actually coming from constituency. Now, that is more sustainable, unlike if everything is, is very theoretical. And the qualitative voices will explain the figures that may come on an issue. Now, if you include qualitative information on any policy, there is an in-depth understanding on, a, on an issue. And then that in-depth understanding is expounded by the voices of the people. And there is nothing that is more appealing to parliamentarians if that issue is not coming from the people they represent. So that is what is making it sustainable. And again, to make it equitable, if the representation of views are coming from all areas across regions, then it will be more equitable and acceptable to everyone to take that policy on board. Bem, eu queria voltar a um exemplo que eu dei aqui, que é do, foi da agroecologia. Eu, se eu vou falar do ponto de vista da ciência, eu acho, quando a ciência ela engloba também o público interessado e juntos eles conseguem influenciar uma política, e isso é, é super importante nesse sentido de, é, da evidência qualitativa ajudar a desenhar, a elaborar determinadas políticas. Outra questão que eu gostaria de levantar tem a ver, inclusive, com o trabalho da velha, é, eu atualmente estou como vice-presidente da SBPC. A SBPC tem feito um trabalho, a, a, a velha mostrou aqui, a influência no parlamento. Então, determinadas questões, nós somos chamados, e como quando não somos chamados, nós pressionamos para sermos chamados, justamente para dar uma evidência é, de determinados aspectos que estão sendo colocados na agenda política. Essa questão, que é essa, é essa relação, existe inclusive uma, um movimento que se chama Iniciativa de Ciência e Tecnologia no Parlamento, que é para fazer justamente essa ponte da ciência com o Parlamento, visando políticas públicas. Uh, and actually, Fernanda here is reminding me one important aspect for qualitative evidence. Qualitative evidence is strong in providing what is it for me. For a decision maker, we we'll look at what is it for him. And if for somebody who wants something to be implemented, we we'll also look at what is it for, the, for, for, for that particular target group. So the sustainability will come in when both the implementer the decision maker and somebody to benefit have all common interest to benefit. So this is the strongest part qualitative evidence would offer. Super, fantastic. So let's move on to the final question. How can citizen engagement help design or develop policies and programs? So this is now moving from using the qualitative evidence to the citizen engagement piece. So I've got two examples here later today in, 
in uh, workshop 14, we're going to talk about citizen panels as a systematic pro uh, process for engaging citizen values into uh, deliberation. Citizen advocacy is something that Walter has talked about, and you'll see some overlap in what he has said with what I have in my partial answer. People need to understand how the system works, how political decisions are made, and then how they can bring data and evidence to bear in those processes. So that's something that we're starting to see many countries do. We, our work in this area is new, inspired by the work that Walter has done. But Walter has some additional thoughts on this point. So Walter, can I turn it over to you? Yeah, uh, the, um, um, uh, here it is important to, to see that uh, we can achieve uh, equity sustainability or make a service acceptable with a people's voice. And one of the, the first challenges that we have in health, but I also say in education, is seeing the user as the, as the passive subject that receives the service, rather than active citizen with voice. So that means to have a structures and systems that are based not, not on one-off consultations, but based on accountability, which is very important in, in Guatemala, for instance, using the legal framework that is not specific to health, but is specifically to the political constitution, we have been able to push for spaces that are not one-off, but there are spaces that are systematic to, to have this engagement. And, and, the second, the, and the second one is that we need to also be clear that because of the, many of the barriers, especially for marginalized population, have to do, as I say, with illegal payments, have to do with working or showing up to work and all of that, that means that to, to implement this, we require systems of checks and balance. Many ministers of health have their own supervision, but that kind of problems gets the, get lots of those reports never reach because they are protecting among themselves. So we need to understand that if we are serious about this. We need to create the structures that will take into account the checks and balance. If we're talking about issues that are uh, sensitive or issues that imply conflict of interest, then it should be a different body, public body, than the Ministry of Health to do this supervision as the Human Rights Commission does, and we work with, with them. Third mic, thanks. Just a quick question before we go to Velia Walter. Are you okay though with an idea that we have both standing and kind of ad hoc one off? Like, because there, there's a variety of times where you would want standing engagement processes, but sometimes issues emerge that are brand new and we need to suddenly hear from service users and citizens more generally? Yes, yes, I, I totally agree on that. The problem is when you only have the ad hoc. Absolutely, you have absolutely. Great, Velia, over to you. Uh, actually, citizen engagement is so crucial because it brings ownership and the accountability is easier done. I will give an example. For example, if a parliament wants to make a law, and this law, there is a lot of consultation done by the citizens. In the parliament, sometimes when people want to, to, to make a law, the opposition may not support it or government may not support it. But if the citizens were involved from the beginning, they will lobby their members of parliament. And when members of parliament are making that legislation, they will make sure that they are supporting what the citizens are looking for. And when these laws are passed, implementation becomes easy because the citizens who own what they promised to do and the follow up will be easy so citizens engagement brings in ownership and accountability great super thank you very much velia so let's move into the q and a session so just remember it would be good if you could be brief with your questions or comments um be respectful of others views so the, the that's certainly been the the tenor of the meeting so far and please uh, don't do like me, speak slowly. So when you ask your question, please speak slowly. Um, there's been a huge amount of progress in this field over the last, I don't know, three, four years. The work of Simon Ruth, many others on grade circual, the mainstreaming of citizen science that we see coming from Walter, parliamentary research offices increasingly looking for research evidence, passionate researchers, 
bringing qualitative evidence to bear. And one of the things that the conference organizers want to do is consolidate where we are and celebrate those triumphs, but also talk about where we need to go in the future. So feel free also in your questions or comments to ask any of the three panelists um, questions about where we need to go. So I see, I don't know if that was a hand up, but can we get hands up for people who have questions? So there are two here, three, four, five questions in the room, and then we'll have online. So can we start with the person back here? Yep. Good morning. My name is Mariana. I'm from University of Federal University of São Paulo, and I have a question for Fernanda, please. I'll speak in Portuguese, and they can translate. Fernanda, muito interessante o seu trabalho com a Olimpíada de Matemática. Muito obrigada pela sua apresentação. Eu queria saber, com o atual risco da perda da bolsa para quem ganha a Olimpíada de Matemática, como que a gente pode fazer essa evidência chegar até esses espaços? Da mesma forma, a gente tem muita pesquisa qualitativa sobre a importância de outros programas importantes de pesquisa. E eu queria saber como que a gente pode fazer isso chegar para a gente poder ter outros programas, como, por exemplo, foi o Ciências Sem Fronteiras, que teve grande impacto na vida das pessoas que participaram, mas que hoje a gente... Como não teve grandes indicativos quantitativos, a gente não tem mais. Obrigada. So I forgot to say, let's take uh, questions in groups of three. So we have one question to Fernanda. So where are we with the mic? Do we just have the one? Oh, there we go. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, my name is Erica Camargo. I work here at Fundação Oswaldo Cruz at the Evidence Program. And please do not kill me, but um, I'm uh, extremely a uh, quantitative researcher and <laughs> yes wait wait <laughs> and I was knocked out by the qualitative uh, during uh, sorry I'm gonna speak English because um, I'm gonna say some um, technical terms okay so I was knocked out during a clinical trial um, a, an effective and as a clinical trial in Manaus with our research group there and during the 24-hour recall with we did it with pregnant women and during um, the 24-hour recall we saw tea what are we going to do with tea with leaves of the Amazon and I said I'm arrogant and I said no there's evidence for everything I'm gonna find it did I find it? No, I did not find it. So we went to the community to ask uh, what the consequences were uh, with a pregnant woman with all of these leaves that we did not know what happened to it. So we, um, uh, today, like about a few months uh, now, uh, we are using this as a qualitative evidence. and. Since we have a bias of quantitative, we went to the chemist and say, okay, I wanna see exactly what this is because I wanna know how it happens inside the body. So, um, can't do we, I, I don't, I'm learning, um, but it, is it necessary for us to do that or do we already have the evidence? That's my question. So maybe if, I don't know if any of you want to take that question when the time comes, uh, who's up next? Ruth? Yep. Hey, I'm Ruth Garside from the University of Exeter. Uh, first, I just wanted to be cheeky and make a plug. If you're interested in uh, CERQUAL, we're actually doing a workshop at 11 this morning, a two-hour workshop about CERQUAL, so please come along. Um, my, my question was about these different ways of involving people's voices, how we engage with the citizen voice. Um, and there are, there's huge amounts of development and I think huge amounts of increased acceptability of all these different approaches, different ways of involving patients and the public in research, in policy making, citizen science, citizen panels. And then there's um, qualitative research and qualitative evidence synthesis. But I get the feeling that for a lot of policymakers, and actually for some researchers not involved in these fields, 
um, they, they get confused about what's what and what the purpose is and what the status of these different kinds of activities are. Um, so you get people saying, oh, we don't need the qualitative research because we've done a consultation with a group of people or we, d we don't need to consult because we've got patient voices for qualitative research. And I just wondered if the panel had any observations about that. And I mean, maybe it doesn't matter, I'm not sure. I think, we, I think we need all of these different approaches for different ways, and the more ways we engage with, we engage the public in decision-making, the better, and the more w different groups of um, citizen voices we have, the better. But I just wondered if there were similar concerns, and if there were, what, what can we do about it? What kind of support do we, or information do we need to give out about the different status, almost, of these different approaches? So just a quick answer myself, and then we'll go down the panel list. Uh, the, the, Ruth, that was the reason why I introduced those first few slides, because I think we often group a lot of things together. And so I think it's very important to keep separate the qualitative evidence piece from um, citizen engagement processes, which often draw on techniques from qualitative research. I think they're very different, but I think they're both absolutely essential. I wouldn't want to see policy developed that didn't have elements of both. And I agree with you that different things are at different stages of development, but we increasingly have very robust approaches in both camps, and we should be building on wherever those are and pushing them to the next frontier. So that, that's my two cents, but Fernanda? Bem, eu vou responder a, a, a USP sobre a UPMEC. É, eu, inclusive, é, fiz um artigo que saiu no Correio Brasiliense, que, o intitulado é, As Bolsas do CNPq e a UPMEC sobre isso. Bem, nós estamos numa luta enorme para que essas bolsas não sejam canceladas. Já tem mais um mês que foi garantido. Agora, a gente nunca sabe, né? Porque é um clima muito instável. Agora, eu gostaria de dizer que é uma questão super importante. Nós vimos é, como um dos impactos, um lado assim, tem um lado do retorno financeiro, mas tem um retorno que é de ordem moral. Eles se sentem super reconhecidos a partir do fato de ganhar essa bolsa de estudo. Então, tem os dois aspectos. Agora, uma outra questão que eu gostaria de dizer é, tem a ver com a questão dela, que foi propriamente dirigida ali, mas eu gostaria de dizer... Eu, aqui a gente, eu tive que correr muito para dar conta do tempo. Quando nós fizemos esse trabalho de avaliação, nós utilizamos a técnica de grupo nominal. Eu quis destacar essa técnica, mas nós usamos também a observação participante. Só que a observação participante, por si só, tem a questão que ela levantou de um, um certo grau a mais de subjetividade. Então, a observação participante, que é interessante nesse grupo nominal, você observar certas atitudes, o cenário, isso foi feito. Né? É, mas nós também utilizamos a técnica do grupo nominal. Bem, é, não, acho que era só isso. I'm going to try to answer your questions about the quantitative, qualitative, see if I understood well. So, so uh, for us, when we work with, uh, with user services, it's very important to understand what sort of, uh, of uh, evidence or what process are we aiming for. For instance, uh, with the, coming from the healthcare field, we can have research on effectiveness of treatment, so different treatments of interest. And then once we know what interventions are effective, then they need to be implemented, which is a very complex process of implementing effective treatments. So use of the services are not aiming to provide evidence for the effectiveness of treatment because that requires specific training and so forth, but they are very important to identify and to monitor and evaluate why an effective intervention, an effective treatment which worked very well in the, in the trial or in the lab, is not having impact in populations. So that's when it comes information to the user that can tell us all the different barriers or problems in the implementation of that policy. So for us, it's part of the continuum of device and research and effective treatments, but that's only the first step. Then we need to implement that intervention. And, and that's a major challenge. It brings a lot of, of complexities. 
It could be because that are not reaching the people supposed to reach. It's because there is, it's not being implemented with the, uh, following the guidelines. So many other different issues that uh, users or services have important information about why they may not be working. Okay. Okay. Simon, do, Simon, no questions online right now. Okay. Who has? Does, if I see hands up, but do anybody have mics yet? Microphones? No. Oh, sorry. There we go. So we'll take three questions, we'll start here. Hi, Shamila from Fiocruz, Brasilia. I think uh, probably Fernando and myself are, are the minority here because we, we are researchers in social studies of science and technology. And um, I'm very curious about the uses of the term co-production. So I was very glad when uh, Vilia pointed it out because there is this key researcher called Sheila Jasanov from the Harvard Kennedy Institute, uh, School of Government that she writes that co-production is when not only you produce uh, scientific knowledge and techno technological innovation, but also a culture that feeds back, feedbacks this process of using science to produce technology. It doesn't matter whether, it, whether it's high density technology or uh, soft technology, social technology. So I see that there is this um, collective efforts from both researchers and the citizens to bring out this culture, to use evidence, whatever type of evidence it is. But as researchers in this field and evidence brokers, how can we bring about this culture of using evidence that is of good quality? And because, Vilia, you mentioned that uh, members of parliament uh, in your country they just have to know uh, English, right? Here in Portuguese, we elected a person who's not even fluent in Portuguese. So there are all these differences, and they're very used with lob lobbying and ad advocacy groups. So it's all about the politics. So how do we build this culture that we go beyond that? And then they have this trusting uh, source with the citizen science movements and with the knowledge brokers. H how, how could we do this? Thank you. Can we go to two more questions? So where's the next microphone? Hi, um, I'm Stephanie Montesanti. I'm at the, from Canada um, with the University of Alberta. My question is for you, Walter. Um, so I'm, um, I do a lot of work with um, indigenous communities, and so that's that space or an area in which um, I've been fortunate um, and honored to, to work in and to learn from my uh, First Nation collaborators who are here with me from Canada. And Mike, I'm really interested in this idea around citizen advocacy. Um, I think while it was how it was defined and how it was described was building that capacity um, in understanding how policy or government works, understanding the political structure or processes. But I think there's the other side of it too, which we're failing to, to think about, which is it's about building the capacity among health system leaders and decision makers to get to a place where First Nations in Canada would call an ethical space. And that ethical space is the space between indigenous knowledge and Western knowledge systems. And that's that space where a common shared of values is created and both knowledge systems are respected and understood. And so I'm curious to know a little bit more, Walter, what your experience has been in working with indigenous communities in Guatemala and how, and how those different knowledge systems have come to bear on informing decisions. Great, thanks. And where's the next microphone? Is there one more? I see Gary with his hand up, but can we just pass it back Gary's been waving? So so I wait. Can you keep waiting so you don't lose the mic? There we go. It's like he's, he's a, he, he, won a, he won a lottery. Yeah, I guess. Uh, um, Gary Assignment with TDR. Uh, just a question to all and to reflect on what John, you said about a, a sort of synthesized qualitative research results. And what I worry or I think we have to face this challenge is again another confusion that qualitative research in general can be used and let's use it obviously and we want to use it but we skip the synthesized part in, if we don't do synthesized part then we are in trouble. And even if you want to mainstream it more and if we mainstream it in low sort of resource setting 
it might be a bit of a challenge to um, not to have it synthesized and not to have some surprises of how qualitative research is used. And this goes for quantitative as well, right? It's not to say that qualitative is different from quantitative. So how can we have a similar language around that, that, that synthesize is a key word in there, and then that way, and only that way, we can actually have the um, acknowledgement and acceptance of any type of research in decision making. And if we don't, then we might be in trouble of how certain things are used. Yeah, a quick reaction on that, and then I'll go down the panelists again. It's just that I guess my preference would be if it's policy making, that in a given jurisdiction, you would want the best synthesized evidence on the array of relevant policy questions, and you would want the best local qualitative studies on the array of relevant questions. To me, it's always an interplay between best global evidence and best local evidence, and they both need to be at the table. Fernanda, do you have any? Eu queria só reforçar o que a Xamila se referiu, a importância, é, por exemplo, para a inovação tecnológica, mesmo dos aspectos culturais, que são diferentes para cada lugar. Essa é uma questão fundamental, eu diria, para a pesquisa. Uma outra questão que eu queria é, colocar também é que, cada vez mais, quando se fala em avaliação de impacto, Anteriormente, a avaliação de qualquer pesquisa, de qualquer produto científico, era feita sobretudo pelos pares, sobretudo vendo impactos cada vez mais. Os usuários é, possíveis daquela pesquisa, por exemplo, na pesquisa de saúde, é, já é uma tradição em alguns países, as associações de pacientes é, justamente é, também é, serem abordados através de determinadas metodologias sobre os impactos daquelas políticas. Então, são algumas questões que eu só queria, na realidade, reforçar a partir das questões gerais que foram formuladas. Um. I will try to shed more light on how we can build a catch of evidence use among different target groups. Actually, what I find to be key are two issues. The first one is investing a lot in capacity building. Once we invest a lot in capacity building and we all have one understanding that every decision should be based on evidence, despite the levels of where we are, people will likely demand evidence. And the second thing I find so crucial is citizens' engagement. That's so powerful. Because when you are consulted, and then you are told to say, the results of our consultations are pointing on the need of ABCD. People feel part of it. People feel responsible for it. Now, one thing I want to share with you is, with our scenario of where our members of parliament are coming from different academic backgrounds, once they are capacitated, they will always ask you person to say, where is that decision coming from? Where is the evidence? All they want is a policy maker to tell them to say, indeed, this policy is emanating from this kind of evidence. Of course, politically, they will argue. They will now begin to look for their own evidence in order to disagree with what is on the table. But still more, what is important there is both parties are using evidence. Now, when it, when it comes to implementation, if these people were consulted, they will likely going to support that kind of implementation. So that's what I can say. So we are talking of capacity building, and engage citizens' engagement. Yes, uh, I, I, I agree with co production. It's very important. Uh, the limitation with that is that building a culture of co production will take the long run. And, and secondly, many communities, management cannot wait for that. So the strategy that we have used is to use the existing legal framework we have in our team and lawyer to see how can we force spaces for voice of people in the community. 
So we have gone even to the judiciary when, and also to the health commission in parliament, but this is not effective. So another strategy is to, to force the opening of channels because the legal framework uh, supports that. So eventually, the culture will come, but because the communities want not only the voice to be heard, but also acted upon, they want to see change. So that's very important. And with the, with the indigenous communities, uh, in our network of 160 community defenders, about 14 of them are traditional birth defenders. And they are very much attacked by the official system because of attending the risk home and all of that. So one of the reasons why they became defenders is because of trying to oppose that, that attack into the, to the practice. So, so yes, we have that situation in Guatemala as well, but the, the idea here is that there are practices with, or there are services within the Western system of health that communities recognize that they do need, like uh, the children vaccination, for instance, that they need emergency care, that they need emergency transport. So they know that even if they are not getting those services, that's when they get organized to demand that those services are implemented. But they maintain their own traditional indigenous system of health as well. So I, I apologize for those of you who didn't get a chance to ask your question. Let's take one online to make sure that there's a bit of equity. And the, uh, can we have the microphone down here, the microphone to the front? So, Sorry about that. I know there were a lot of people in the room that still had a question, but can we just quickly get an online question? We just have about two minutes left. Son, is it a relatively easy question that can be answered succinctly? What is the nature of the inverse according to quality? Um, so this is a question from Fernanda Machado um, for Walter. Once you start to collect evidence from the from communities, do they change their views about research? Do they demand new data? Yes, the, the, the respondent, yes, because they also understand where to deliver this information and they also start asking for more responses about, what, about why services are not being delivered or why they are not reaching those in demand. So as I mentioned, just this engagement of the community is an empowering process that started by wanting to communicate my challenges, but then when they get to learn how the system works, how the state apparatus works, where to go, it's an empowering process that they get more and more involved with public services, with the public system. Fantastic, super. So we're out of time, unfortunately. So I'm gonna skip the wrap up piece and just quickly uh, deal with some housekeeping. So thank you very, very much to our three speakers. We've got, we're very, very fortunate to have a passionate researcher in Fernanda, a passionate policymaker and assistant to parliamentarian in, in uh, Belia, and an incredibly passionate engager of citizens uh, in decision-making processes in Walter. Normally, I say, if you have questions that you didn't get a chance to ask, come up right after, but you heard from Claire, the bell is gonna ring, and we are all gonna rush to the photograph so please let the three of them get the photograph taken and then catch them uh, right after. Uh, please do weigh in on the symposium virtual platform. I've said we have a lot to celebrate in this field, but we also have a lot of work ahead and it would be hugely helpful to hear from all of you uh, how we should focus our efforts. Um, so please go into the garden. Uh, we're gonna do the photo and can I check with Claire, Simon, uh, Georgie, are there any other housekeeping items you want me to flag? No, do we have the bell in the room? Can we ring the bell? All right, out into the garden for the photo. Thank you very much.